Anthropologists still study pygmies today, and for good reasons. Why not be curious about the differences? So different places will have a very different culture and also very different biological adaptation to the particular environment. So of course, if you first met someone that is very different from you, this is something interesting. And the pygmies are very black, very curly hair, and very short. So when you see these differences, it's striking. Because they were so different to whites, McGee believed that pygmies were a living, missing link between apes and humans, the lowest rung of the evolutionary ladder. I think this is basically the influence of the culture at, uh, of the time. Perhaps for the Victorian mind, you know, where men are always dressed and religion is very important and uh, the morals are very established. You cannot understand the place that the culture is completely different. So, yeah, it would be very uh, interesting to, to study them at that time, I think. Over in the Congo, the explorer Samuel Werner had been laid low for weeks with malaria. But he was about to come across the first of the pygmies on his shopping list. It was on an occasion when he was going up the Congo River and uh, the boat broke down, the steamboat. And the captain said it would take two weeks for the spare parts to come. And he was told by the captain that, uh, that he shouldn't go into this area. Uh, they should all stay on the boat until they got the parts to fix it uh, because there might be cannibals in the area. Well, that's all he had to tell my grandfather. There were cannibals. And boy, he was out there in a minute. Uh, looking for them, wanting to talk to them, wanting to maybe share a meal with them, who knows. And when he walked into one of their villages, he found that they had captured people in local tribal wars and were keeping them in cages. And some of them apparently uh, even preparing uh, for them to be eaten. That's when he encountered uh, his first uh, pygmy. My grandfather's first impressions were that the pygmy was a particularly fine specimen of the sort of people that he wanted to bring to St. Louis. And he asked the pygmy if he would like to go with him. The pygmy expressed that he'd rather take his chances with uh, uh, St. Louis than suffer being eaten by the cannibal tribe. My grandfather traded uh, a roll of brass wire and some salt for um, the pygmy's freedom. Uh, the pygmy's name was Otabenga. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think he had never seen white people before. And Werner offered him some water, and that sort of created an initial good impression. He spoke to Werner in his native Chaluba, which Werner understood and could speak back. With Otto Benga's help, Werner managed to persuade five other pygmies to leave the Congo. Nearly six months after he started his mission, he was ready to make his return trip across the Atlantic. Once he got to Matadi, he could get on a steamer that took him directly over to the United States through New Orleans. They, they had a stop in Cuba, by the way, in Havana along the way, probably to pick up some cigars. The journey was pretty uneventful, and the, um, the pygmies probably thought it was a very long journey, much longer than, than they were used to. And they, they also wanted to know how the boat was powered. They thought that it had a cage full of hippopotamuses down beneath it that were pedaling it along. And Werner showed them how the steam engine worked. Mid-June, 1904, the pygmies caught their first glimpse of America. They docked in New Orleans. Now it was the pygmies' turn to explore. They marveled at the size of buildings, at the way the streets were laid out, and how complex things were, and how people had houses full of bright and beautiful things. So. It was very strange to them, but I don't think they had any fear.
While Werner recovered from his malaria, he sent the pygmies to St. Louis by rail. Of course, that too was an amazing thing for them to, to be on a, on a railroad train. In St. Louis, the pygmies would be the anthropologist William McGee's most important example of an inferior race. But Werner, the explorer who'd lived among the pygmies, had come to a very different conclusion about them. Pioneering in Central Africa, uh, the major book written by my grandfather. Let me look in the index, I, on the chapter on pygmies in here. Of one fact, my experience and observation completely convince me that these pygmies are human beings in every sense of the word. He lived among them, and so he knew about them. McGee's human zoo was to be the centerpiece of a giant international exhibition, the St. Louis World's Fair. Since 1851, world fairs had been held across the globe to celebrate human progress. They showed off the latest in culture and new inventions. In St. Louis, the first ice cream cone and Dr. Pepper's soft drink were unveiled to the world. The fair would last seven months, but today there's almost no trace left of this extravaganza. Well, we would be about at the center point of our fabulous fair right here. We would be standing right next to Festival Hall, which was the uh, huge auditorium with the huge dome larger than St. Peter's in Rome. People would come here and just take in the, the lovely view. And then below us is the Grand Basin, that would have been dotted with all sorts of gondolas, swan boats, little lagoons would go off to the side to some of the other palaces. Um, you could go around the fair on a, on a donkey. There were even people on a giant turtle. There was an Irish village, Tyrolean Alps. Actually, they were um, artificial mountains uh, that were constructed in the background. 20 million people visited our fair, so every day there would be hundreds of thousands of people here. But in this celebration of human progress, McGee's 2,000 human exhibits were going to steal the show. His plan was coming together. He had already assembled 300 Filipinos. The Patagonian giants were on a boat from Liverpool to New York. 400 barbarian Igorots and Negritos were stranded in San Francisco waiting for the weather to clear. The hairy Ainu from Japan were making their way from Vancouver. But the most eagerly awaited were the pygmies. African pygmies for the World Fair. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, June 26, 1904. Here are some career facts about African pygmies. They live in forests. They are extremely shy. They eat the flesh of wild animals killed with poison arrows. They're extremely cunning and dexterous. They are cruel, finding delight in torturing animals. They have long heads, long narrow faces. And little red eyes, set close together like those of ferrets. Their bodies are exceptionally hairy. A pygmy has been known to eat 60 bananas at one meal, in addition to other foods, and then ask for more. If caught young, they are said to make excellent servants. They seem to be controlled by an impulse that makes them delight in wickedness. McGee's exhibits would spend months living in an enclosure on the fairground. He wanted them to recreate their lives at home. They built houses, cooked authentic foods, kept animals they brought with them, performed traditional ceremonies and dances, and they wandered amongst the other exhibits. For visitors to the fair, it seemed as if the whole world had come to St. Louis, and the anthropological lessons were clear. In many ways, it was a cool idea. The visitors would come and see contrasts. And so this is the people from Patagonia, and so you can see he wears shoes, and he's got um, trousers on and um, suspenders. So the pygmies would be more savage in this scheme of McGee's, because they're partially naked. McGee thought that the um, pygmies looked like gorillas. They had a darker skin, which looked like gorillas' dark, dark hair or a chimpanzee's dark hair. Um, they also had some ceremonies that would imitate the sounds of chimpanzees. But for McGee, it wasn't just the pygmies' appearance that betrayed their inferior racial type. 
but their behavior. They had uh, certain kinds of religions that were thought to be really primitive. Here they're illustrating a uh, ceremonial decapitation. Now probably the visitors would just, and you can see a couple of visitors in the back there, would probably think this is just a primitive rite. And they would take it as a sign of savageness rather than looking and seeing that they were performing rituals that, 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 say, similar to Catholics would do in churches and things like that. As the fair went on, Otta Benga began to draw the most attention. He was described in the press as a dwarfy black specimen of sad-eyed humanity. But the pygmy was turning performer. He used to get um, paid to smile for photographs and would get five cents and 25 cents and sign his autograph, which is how they made money there. The pygmies turned out to be great entrepreneurs, and they saw this as a diplomatic mission. It had nothing to do with racial categories. They were on a mission to the United States to demonstrate and to show Americans how cultured and civilized they were. They didn't realize that McGee was putting up signs that said they were savages. It never occurred to them. No matter what his subjects thought, McGee was able to draw the conclusions he wanted from his anthropological experiment. The results are contained in his original report. It's been hidden away for the best part of a century, rarely recovered from the archives. He was described by McGee in his, in his report as very typical because he was exactly the right height that everybody thought pygmies should be. And because he was the right skin color, and because he had filed teeth, it basically reinforced the stereotypes that people came to the fair with. So he became the archetype, the model, the perfect one. In his report, McGee seems to have had no doubt that the pygmies were every bit as savage as he'd imagined. But as the fair went on, the pygmies were unwittingly frustrating all of McGee's theories. The pygmies used to go out and one of their favorite things to do was buy cigars. Um, they would get cigars every day and one of the people in the Turkish pavilion would give it to them. And McGee used to get mad because pygmies are too primitive to smoke cigars, therefore he would take those away. In fact, the newspapers called him the overlord of the savage world. And then all the pygmies had top hats and they used to wear them all the time. And that didn't coincide with the pictures and what they wanted to present at the fair. For McGee, the misbehavior of the pygmies was the final straw. He believed his anthropological experiment had been scuppered and that he'd failed to gather enough evidence for the superiority of the white race. A year after the fair, he would turn his back on humans and choose to study rocks instead. But by the time the fair closed in December 1904, and the savages were on their way home. Twenty million people had passed through its gates, and most went away believing that anthropology had publicly demonstrated that the white race was superior. For them, racism had been given a scientific seal of approval, and scientific racism was now set to change the course of the 20th century. Almost a year, Otta Benga and the other pygmies had lived in America, exhibits in a human zoo. In 1905, the explorer Samuel Phillips Werner took them back to their home in the Congo. But Otta Benga found that he had no home to go back to. He thought he would rejoin his tribe, which he found had been completely eliminated. So Werner suggested that maybe he would get along with the Batois and he in fact married a young woman from the Batois and uh, she got bitten by a poisonous snake and died and then the Batois rejected him as being a bad influence on them he felt a stranger he felt like he was not accepted in his own land anymore <laughs> 